Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the March meeting of the CCS. Uh, good again to see a good number of you here with us. Uh, may I introduce our speaker? Uh, today is a speaker, not a, a gang of uh, conspirators, as we had last time. Um, David Link is from Germany. Welcome. He has a PhD in philosophy, which of course makes him very well qualified to talk about this issue. <laughs> like everyone else around here, of course. Um, he had a thesis on text generating algorithms in the early years of computer development, which, as far as I can see, was a, uh, an excuse for learning about Christopher Strange and what he did in those days in Manchester. So I'm looking forward very much to hearing what he's going to talk about. David. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and uh, also. Um, uh, I have to say it's a great pleasure and a big honor for me to, to be here and uh, so thanks uh, very much to the Computer Conservation Society and uh, to the Science Museum to invite me uh, here. Um, the title of my talk today is uh, The Archaeology of Very Early Algorithms 1948 to 1958. Uh, Christopher Strachey's Love Letter Generator and the first question one could uh, have is uh, why does the title talk about archaeology and not simply history of uh, very early algorithms? Well, the reason is that, uh, in my opinion, these complex uh, algorithmic objects we are dealing with in, uh, when we deal with uh, computers uh, get lost or buried at a much faster pace than uh, other objects. And this is due to, uh, mainly, to uh, due to three reasons. One is the complexity of this artifact, which uh, I think is self-explanatory. The second one uh, is the idealization of artifacts. So at a certain point in the technical development, uh, approximately probably with the light bulb, you, um, the effects and the components of artifacts start to disappear. So for example, the light bulb already achieves an immaterial effect. The successor, so to say, of the light bulb, the electron tube, um, uh, achieves an effect that is almost invisible. Like the main, uh, the, the purpose of an electron uh, tube is not to display a uh, elect uh, array of electrons, but to fulfill certain electronic functions that are invisible by definition. And uh, so if somebody who doesn't know anything about an elect electron tube uh, uh, looks at an electron tube, it's very difficult for him or her to, to find out what this was supposed to do. Uh, so the only chance in that case would be to find out how this was uh, um, put into practice and then to try to switch it on again, to actually see what it does. And um, the, uh, this idealization can also be seen by the so-called black boxing of uh, components. So nowadays, many components, uh, especially with uh, SMD technology, look very much the same. So you, as an external, non-initiated observer, you have no chance to, to find out without a manual what this uh, item, like an integrated chip, for example, is doing. And um, the third factor that leads to this, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if burying is the, the correct term. In, in German, it would be Verschüttung. So like in war, uh, a lot of objects get verschüttet and are, are somehow lost. Um, a third reason for that is the if these objects, and not all algorithmic objects, are programmed. If these objects are instructed with symbols or controlled by symbols, then typically the symbols that are used to control these objects, for example, operation codes or assembly language or programming language, um, are typically, especially in the early areas where there exist no higher languages and there are high constraints on how long expressions can be, uh, the language is much more arbitrary than uh, everyday language that is shared. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a known fact that also natural language is arbitrary, but at least it's shared between a lot of users. So I can't, uh, if I want to be understood here, I can't 
decide that I will uh, use completely different words, whereas in programming I could uh, do something that would be very similar to this operation and it wouldn't result as long as I uh, still talk in the right code to the machine, it wouldn't mean that the machine wouldn't understand me any longer. And uh, so that's the explanation for archaeology. The other question is why, or could be, why 1948 to 1958? Um, 1948 uh, is the date when the Manchester Baby um, executed its first, um, here is the reconstruction by, the well-known, I guess, in this room, reconstruction by Christopher Burton. Um, when it executed its uh, first uh, calculation. And 1958 is the date when the Ferranti Mark I in Manchester University, as far as I know, was uh, taken down. So, and uh, one could even make this uh, period slightly shorter by um, cutting away the beginning and uh, say that uh, actually the period from 1952 to 1958 is the most interesting one because before 1958 uh, there were no real uh, there was no uh, finished set of library routines that uh, would have permitted to do easy programming at least that's uh, the opinion of uh, Ken Liversley the, who pioneered engineering techniques on the machine he writes in, in one article that from 1952, it was actually possible to do real programming jobs of, on the machine. That might be disputed, actually. I, I know of programs that date, that are uh, serious programs, so to say, that date from 1951, but I haven't encountered a programming a list, a real program list, uh, from 1948 to 1950. I haven't been able to find that. Apart from test programs, test routines like the highest common factor, like the like the highest common uh, factor routine, and um, um, after the the baby, as I think this uh, story I, I can tell very quickly because everybody knows it. It evolved into Manchester Mark One in 1949. And then the Ferranti firm of uh, the uh, Manchester firm of Ferranti produced the Ferranti Mark One in 1950, which was installed in the uh, in Manchester University in 1951. And um, this uh, the main component or the most uh, important component of this computer were was the Williams or Williams Kilburn tube. Um, that was the first uh, reliable uh, means of volatile storage. Here you see a bit uh, pattern on the Williams tube. And uh, the f this, I, th I guess this is also a well-known story that the Manchester baby evolved out of the question, is it possible to use this memory we have here now with a computer? How can we find out? We have to build a computer. Um, I have uh, investigated a bit how uh, Williams, um, uh, where, where from actually uh, Frederick Williams got the idea to use simple CRTs as storage means. And this uh, research uh, led me into the topic of moving target indication in radar systems. So many of the people that uh, were uh, working on computers as engineers or mathematicians typically during the war, war were working as, uh, like the engineers were usually working in radar research, <coughs> the mathematicians were usually working in cryptology. And um, um, it is also a known fact that um, when Frederick Williams went to the USA in 1949, approximately, um, that there at the uh, radiation laboratory at uh, MIT, he learned of uh, experiments to store, to create a moving target indication system that stored the information on CRTs, which uh, never um, uh, became, uh, which was never uh, used because it uh, wasn't possible during wartime to develop it to, to a point where it was practically usable. 
Um, but this uh, system is also documented in the volume, I think, 19 of the famous Radiation Lab series and on which uh, Frederick Williams uh, collaborated. And I have also found the uh, research paper of the group that uh, worked on moving target indication. So if anybody is interested, I can give the reference. And this, uh, these papers are also <coughs> freely uh, available. And what you see here is on the left side, I think that's an image that comes from the Radiation Lab series. On the left side you see the problem, which uh, was called clutter at the time. So the problem was that the radar, radar operator was irritated by a lot of non-interesting static objects that also reflect the, the radar beams. And on the right side you see the same image after the static information had been subtracted in a very primitive way out of the picture. But to be able, and that's very interesting, to uh, subtract something that stays, you need also a medium that is capable of storing this. So the medium has all the information also has to stay, otherwise you can't subtract it at the next, in the next frame, so to say. And, um, so. Uh, this is the reason why, apart from the, the early uh, television systems uh, where you have delay lines and so on, the first uh, rather reliable means of volatile storage emerged out of uh, moving target indication. And uh, programming on the machine, also just a reminder, or I'm, I think, uh, I feel I'm bringing owls, owls to Athens here. So this is the Bordeaux code that was used to, um, uh, to program the machine, um, which uh, made the pain of programming, I think, even higher, because this is a non-alphabetic arbitrary sequence of um, of letters that's taken from uh, Trutel's lab notebook from 1948. And um, I will quickly, yeah, this is the first page of the Love Letters algorithm written by Christopher Strachey around 1952. And I will just quickly use it to carry another owl to Athens and to explain the operations code on the machine. So if we try to interpret this line, se slash p, so every command has four characters, and every character stands for five bits. And uh, se slash p, um, slash p means, the, uh, I think, an inconditional jump, so very much like go to, go to a basic. <coughs> and then the first two characters uh, give the address, which is again quite uh, difficult to interpret because it's uh, a high significant bit first. Um, um, is that right? Uh, it's, anyway, it's uh, exactly the other way around than we would expect today. So SE is actually the line that is uh, marked here. So SE. And here the first two characters are R slash and R slash is this line. So this command means jump to this line and it reappears as you can see several times in the program and uh, so the program can return I think here it returns to it's a branch and it returns always to the to the um, to the starting point of the branch by this SE slash P. Oh and um, Another component, I just need to add that for later, another component of the system that you can see here. Um, so here you have the Williams tubes. These are not uh, monitors, as one could think, but uh, this is only the memory of the machine, so that you can actually see the memory is a, a by effect of the storage medium. And uh, this is the console. And uh, here on the left is the paper, that's the paper tape that was used to input and out for the information. Here you would see the paper punch, I guess, and that's the teleprinter. And the teleprinter is another interesting item because it's, um, it was used during the war for communication in the field. 
So um, one already had a, a typewriter that typed when electrical signals were sent to him. So it was quite, and there were, after the war, war there were a lot of type, uh, teleprinters uh, that had no function. So it was quite, why would you invent a device? It was already there. So I think Turing got this typewriter by contacts, uh, through certain contacts with uh, uh, the ministry. And um, uh, this typewriter was actually what you, played very much the function of a monitor today. Or, or that was the way how you would output information out of the system, apart from uh, punching paper tape, but that was the display to humans, let's say. And um, my personal story, so I'm coming back to your comment on my excuse, um, to, to get to know about Strachey's love letter program. My um, first contact actually didn't occur in my PhD, but um, when I was investigating early programs uh, for text generation uh, on the computer, I was wondering that the first uh, text ge generating program ever was said to be ELISA by Josef Weizenbaum, which was, 19, was published in 1966 and two things astonished me. One was that uh, I couldn't believe that uh, something so natural and so simple as uh, text generation would have happened, uh, let's say, uh, 1950s, so 16 or even 18 years after the first computer had been around. And the third thing that, uh, the second thing that uh, struck me was that uh, I, um, couldn't, uh, that ELISA seemed too complex actually, because ELISA is already a, a dialogue program, for example, so it's actually uh, uh, slightly too complex for one man to think that up. And uh, so to illustrate um, uh, in this book this uh, very primitive form of text generation, I chose uh, an example from 1997, one of the very primitive text generators you find all over the internet, which, which was called Romans Rider, and which uh, created very stupid um, pseudo-variable uh, Roman stories. And uh, then, uh, after this uh, book had been published, I read in Andrew Hodges' biography that Turing had, had uh, actually worked with a colleague on a program for the generation of love letters. And shortly after, I was uh, able to find out that the source code of this program had been preserved in Bodleian Library in Oxford, which is also funny because uh, if you think usually Ox in Bodleian Library, Oxford, you find papers from the 12th or 14th century, you wouldn't uh, expect a computer program there. And when I was uh, showing uh, the superintendent, uh, Colin Harris, that actually part of his archive could be run on computer, it uh, was a, a very funny moment for him. And, um, so um, what, I, um, what I did then was trying to emulate this machine. And uh, the, the program was written by Christopher Strachey. I think you, you all know Christopher Strachey. So uh, he uh, was probably, uh, could be called the first programmer. At least he one day turned, uh, turned up in the Manchester University lab with a program that uh, played drafts and finished by playing God Save the Queen on the so-called hooter or loudspeaker. And uh, nobody in the laboratory, as far as the, the uh, story goes, didn't believe that a program of that length, that I think it was about 10 pages, would ever run, and especially created by an outside user with no knowledge on the, on the machine, would actually run on the machine. And uh, he did a bit of uh, bug fixing during nights, and the program ran. And that uh, I think that's uh, Martin Campbell Kelly who writes that um, uh, that actually created a um, not a merit, but a uh, so he has a, has a lasting. Um, I don't get the English word for. 
component uh, Ruf of as a programmer from that and was cons consequently hired by NRDC and worked on a lot of uh, projects. I will talk about that <coughs> in, a, in a second. And this uh, actually uh, Bill Olle uh, wrote me that uh, kind of these cards uh, around uh, 1953 or 54 started to appear on the notice boards in Manchester, uh, the Manchester Computing Laboratory. And you can see here also the reliability of the machine that you can hear also on the, on the recording that turned up. You see that here it's the, the system crashes and then here again it crashes so you can, uh, you can estimate the so-called uptime from that fact. And um, um, so I decided to um, try to reconstruct this program. <coughs> and uh, started to write an emulator and this brought me quite uh, early on in contact with a lot of uh, people from the Computer Conservation Society because uh, typically you can find a lot of information in archives and in, uh, in libraries and the internet naturally uh, but uh, at a certain point uh, you won't, certain information you won't be able to find in any documentation there is like uh, unofficial, for example, the, the question I was asking uh, some of you uh, already, there's a strange object, and that's also a very typical situation for this kind of archaeology. Here, on the top of this machine, is what I call an uh, Odradek. From there's a very strange story by Kafka that describes an object that is impossible to understand. And here we have a very typical object of this sort. I have asked uh, several people what this was. I think the, I originally thought it was the Hooter. Then I learned that the Hooter must be slightly bigger, so it can't be the, the loudspeaker. And uh, anybody who is uh, able to tell me what this object is, I would be extremely grateful to learn. I think I have remembered it is a warning from the power supply room, which was almost as big as the computer room, if it got too hot. Okay. Uh, that's what I think it is. I've got in quite many, many years. Is it, is it a lamp? It's a lamp, yeah. It's a lamp? I think it's a lamp. I just said wait. On the first X time. I think it's in the power <coughs> generator room. Okay. Is enormous. Is and you... Is it screwed to the wall? No, it's, it's on the top of the... Uh, Oh, and it's on a plexiglass yeah. stand or so. Yeah, I, you know, it's just a vague memory now, so I could be wrong, but that's what I'm trying to And what uh, color would the lump be? I wouldn't remember that. It never came on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we don't have a color photo of this part of the machine, so we are completely stuck here. But the power supplies were much, much bigger than any of the computer. Okay. Because you've got 300 volts. Yes. 200 volts and minus 150 in amps. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, I think this investigation will be ongoing. And uh, as you all know, I'm, I'm trying to rebuild this. And there's a chess clock on there, but I will talk about that uh, slightly later. I have to uh, control myself here. Um, Okay. What you see here is the uh, general flow diagram of the machine. And uh, so you see it's printing out a number of control characters. And then it's uh, starting, it's uh, generating a random number, which is also quite an interesting feature of the machine that uh, can be used for uh, many things that are less nice than running love values. And depending on this random value, um, two syntactic structures, structures are uh, generated. Either the machine generates sentences of the form my adjective noun adverbially verbs you are adjective noun, or you are my ad adjective noun. These are the two possibilities. And if uh, in the first case um, it uh, goes this, the, down the same branch twice, 
it even cuts the second occurrence. Uh, so it would say, you are my darling Moppet, and then it would say, my uh, loving duck or so. So it wouldn't repeat, the, it would evade the redundancy in, uh, in the syntax, which is quite advanced. I mean, Eliza didn't have features like that. Um, then comes the full stop, the whole, whole circle you see here, or the loop is uh, executed five times. And then control, uh, formatting characters, I mean, by saying control characters. And uh, then it says yours, another adverb. Uh, this is uh, an error on the original flow diagram. Yours, and then adverbially, needs to be MUC for Manchester University Computer. And uh, you already saw the first page of the algorithm as it is preserved in the special collections in Bodleian Library. This is the program. But um, here you already start to um, suspect that this is kind of strange code because it's somehow it's like a cryptogram. It behaves as if, or it looks like you could read it. And actually, if you start to read the lines from the back, then you can see that love. For example, it's written here, duck, moppet, uh, sweetheart. So that's the, the uh, words that uh, the machine starts the sentence with. Here we have all the adjectives written in a similar fashion. The reason for that is that the um, uh, routine that printed these matters out was uh, written in a way that it was reading the lines backwards. So you, you, that's a normal thing in this machine that uh, the numbers and data changes directions all the time, which makes it uh, slightly difficult to understand certain conventions in the machine. And so, but which uh, seems to be uh, or is natural, I think, from an engineering standpoint, but unfortunately not from a symbolic standpoint. So if you read this, you have anxious, wistful, and so on. The page number four. Uh, you see it's the same for the nouns, desire, wish, fancy. And these are the adverbs, uh, anxiously, wistfully, curiously. And the verbs, uh, desires, wishes. Ah, and here you see that it's even possible to have uh, two words as uh, because the, the subroutine would go until, so these are, uh, the slashes are spaces, and uh, so uh, it will jump over this space because it will print out the corresponding row until it's encountered, it encounters a quote character, and then it would return to the where it had left the program. So actually ge the generation of uh, love letters is uh, reduced here to uh, the administration of addresses. Because, as you can uh, show that also. Um, as you can see, so here you have the, the actual words. But here, you already, <coughs> that's the addresses. For example, FE is, if we look at, no, it's not possible. Um, Usually the <coughs> usually the addresses of the words on the page are then found here. Here, I think it works. No, no, it doesn't work. But it's uh, I will find it later. I, it's, uh, I had a marked. Uh, I had a version where it was marked. So the addresses were actually found of all the words on the page were actually found here. And then you uh, the writing a love letter reduces to sending the right addresses to the printing routine, which is a much more simple task. And, um, ah, yeah. and I started uh, implementing this emulator with a lot of help from uh, Brian Nepper especially, but also from uh, Christopher Burton and from uh, Simon Levington. 
uh, without whom uh, it would have, wouldn't have been possible to find out certain certain details about the machine. And um, uh, I implemented an em emulator, and uh, it ran all the test programs in the manuals that uh, are full of errors because they were written by Turing. Um, so after the, the errors were fixed, they were running. And um, it's an interesting question if these errors were put in there so that you needed to learn programming to understand the manual. So it wasn't possible to just read it and pretend you had understand because then the your supervisor would see if you come back and you say, did you read it? Yes, I understood it. And you don't, if you didn't say then that uh, there were certain errors in the manual, it was a clear sign that you hadn't read the manual, which is quite an interesting technique to, to control the reading process. And um, I uh, then uh, typed down the program that you see here and uh, started it with uh, big uh, hopes, naturally, and the program wouldn't run. And uh, then I discovered the, this perm thing here, which refers to a page of uh, constant values that needs to be there. I included that. Uh, the program still didn't work. Then, and you can see the quality, that's, uh, I ordered them from Germany, so I didn't uh, scan them. It's, it's, uh, I, I saw the originals. It's very, very faint, very small letters, and uh, written with a pencil, so uh, I don't know how long this uh, material will be in a state that you can find details like that. I think in like 20 years, all that remains from this page will be the main program without the notes. And this is uh, rather sad because here you can't even read it in the in the best uh, scan I have, but I could at a certain point read it. It's written ink print, and ink print I already mentioned the routine um, is the routine that uh, sends the material to the printer, and this um, uh, routine wasn't there. And I'm very happy that this reminds me um, to uh, mention also Martin Campbell Kelly thank him also again, because uh, I then wrote to Martin Campbell Kelly if he actually uh, knew of a routine named Engprint and uh, nobody could find anything uh, of that sort. I couldn't find any documentation of this function and so on. And um, that was three months later. And uh, that was the point where I had decided to put the project down and uh, because I had wasted enough time. And uh, uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, there's a certain drive that drives you to do really crazy things. And having learned the, the opcodes of the machine, I then uh, started to rewrite the routine in the, in the old command set. And uh, I, I think I... Oh, yeah. I have searched this in my notebook uh, yesterday. So this is my attempt to, this is only the, like a flow diagram of how it should work. It's not the actual coding, but it's just the setting of the line. So the B, B line 5 is set to 4, then the accumulator is set to B4 and so on and so forth. And uh, I did uh, two or three revisions of this uh, program until I was happy with it. It's not easy to write a program in a very, very low-level language on only one page. And it was clear that the subroutine could only be one page. So I had to uh, actually rework this to be able to fit it on the page. I, uh, and I mean, you, uh, it's completely clear that this is a crazy attempt. I mean, you know nothing about the program because, um, oh, I didn't mention that. It's impossible to read the Love Letters software. If you try to follow the program through step by step, it might be that some, some of you are able to, to do this. Uh, I commented the complete Love Letters program line by line and it didn't give me any clue what this was doing because all you get is write number something to store something, get number from there to there and so on and it's a lot of numbers that are moved but you can't get the general scheme out of the program. So reading and I think this is also important for the 
what I call the archaeology of algorithms, reading of algorithms, I think, quite generally and also today, is not a, a sufficient thing to understand an algorithm. And, or in most cases, might be possible in, in uh, very simple cases, like the Hello World program, for example, can be understood simply by reading, but any sufficiently complex program uh, can usually not be understood by reading only. And um, so, um, this program I knew nothing about, this routine, I knew what it was doing because I had written it myself, but uh, then you have also the interconnections between the, like the so-called scheme B, which was the routine changing sequence. And uh, you find out the, about this uh, scheme, like where to put the number that uh, calls up the subroutine and so on and so forth. But um, to be sure that they are not um, part, that parts of this program didn't override um, values that the main program was using, was, uh, I couldn't simply make that clear. I tried to use B lines that were not used by the main program, but you never know. I, um, started the program with the Engprint routine and uh, absolutely magically it, it ran and it's running until today, which uh, was absolutely uh, an absolutely amazing experience. And funnily enough, uh, last March I went to Botlane Library to copy a lot of stuff and I found the Engprint routine. <laughs> and um, I thought, or before I had, uh, I was I was arguing um, that the original routine must have been quite close to what I was programming because there are very um, uh, many constraints on the programming. So uh, I thought there weren't many uh, ways to actually do it. And uh, what I say now is not to disfavor the use of speculative elements in this kind of archaeology. I think it's absolutely necessary and important to use speculative elements to be able to restore parts that are otherwise not restorable, while at the same time being aware of the historical responsibility that one has, because uh, uh, in 10 or 20 years probably nobody will know that uh, this reconstruction wasn't considered. It's, with, it's, with, it's uh, like with films like Enigma, in 20 years probably nobody will be there to say, oh, this Enigma film was just a love story and uh, nobody meant to depict the real events or so. So it's, this is a dangerous point about this kind of speculation. But other than that, um, it only shows my wrong thinking because actually the, the actual routine here, I didn't analyze it from a structural viewpoint, I just compared the letters. Um, the routine that I found has almost nothing to do apart from the functionality with what I wrote. It also doesn't work. So if I run the program with this routine, the emulator stops to work. So I haven't, haven't had time to look into this. Um, I find this very, um, very funny and a very interesting situation. So the fake runs better than the original and I can't get rid of the fake and I even know now that what I have is not authentic and I have to continue to use it because the real thing doesn't work. But okay. Um, I'm running the fake now and I, I told you it's a fake so it should be okay. But only, so what you see here is the emulator um, with a very poor representation of the uh, user interface. Please excuse that, I didn't work at that aspect at the time. So um, you see the, that's the simulator and what you will see now is actually the original software with the routine written by myself. So the printing routine is, was authored by me. And you see now what was uh, once described as a mad dance, the mad dance of the dots. This is running at full speed now. No, it has nothing to do with the real speed of the machine. And you can see it's again composing love letters. <laughs> and one could ask now how the, 
uh, this idea come uh, about to generate, to use the first machine of this kind ever to generate love letters? It's, uh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, it's because it's also unclear, like from a utilitarian perspective, if the computer is composing love letters uh, to the user, so if it's addressing the user and telling, if the computer now tells the user, I love you, or if it's writing for the user in a kind of Cyrano de, de Bergerac way, so actually you have a love letter to give it to somebody that, um, that, uh, that you love. And uh, I favor the second interpretation. One thing that uh, I think is interesting about uh, this, this topic is that uh, uh, according to psychologists, uh, love is a phenomenon that is very much uh, determined by phenomena of uh, projection. Right? That's, I think it's a common psychological commonplace. And uh, one link one could create between love letters and computers is that um, uh, both don't work without projection. Because if you do not project something into the dots, they're just dots. I mean, they, they, uh, they are in reality your holiday photos, but if you don't project that into them, they are, like if you don't give a certain interpretation to the, uh, to the um, uh, matrix of, um, uh, uh, of uh, dots and crosses, or however, of bits, then uh, it's without any significance. It's just then a, a quite uh, uh, hypnotic game, or so, or a lighting show, or something like that. So that's something, probably, and also uh, probably love letters seem to be a genre that was stereotype enough to be attempted because it's a well-known fact that uh, uh, the genre of writing love letters in most cases uh, reuses known components and at the other hand would be interesting enough to, to raise uh, considerable interest in case it would work out, which they didn't know from the beginning. Um, this research actually happened uh, as part of a quite interesting collaboration or a conference se series called Variantology that uh, was created <coughs> by uh, Siegfried Zielinski. I co-authored the, the second volume. It's a kind of try at um, interdisciplinarity, um, which has become a word for uh, non-interesting uh, non-controversial um, meetings of people who are interested in nothing. Now to try to uh, do interdisciplinary uh, things in a, uh, in a strong way. So uh, passionately try to understand what colleagues from other uh, sciences are dealing with and are trying to do. And I think uh, uh, the, the conferences at least uh, showed that this was something that uh, can work, actually. Um, the next uh, step in the project was then, or the next logical step, was then to try to rebuild parts of the machine. And uh, I'm currently uh, rebuilding the console of the machine. And, uh, or an abstracted version, I should say, of the console of the machine and the uh, tubes and uh, the console. Um, so yeah, that was actually, I should start this in, in a different way, sorry. And with this um, uh, reconstruction, the question is what kind of materials can you find to uh, base your reconstruction on. In case of the Manchester Mark, uh, of the Ferranti Mark I rebuild, these were mainly, there's a huge and wonderful discussion in Chris paper on the different materials and how to use the different uh, remains that uh, 
uh, existed from the from the baby machine. In my case, it was also I can say two photos I uh, managed to locate. One uh, in the Manchester uh, Museum uh, of uh, Science and Industry in the archive. I found this color photos and uh, was absolutely thrilled. Where uh, I think everybody else knew that they existed, but nobody had told, uh, told me. And then uh, this is a very high resolution photo, and I guess it's the only color photo of the machine. And this again from uh, Mosi, uh, the Ferranti Mark One in the in the factory, and also this is high resolution. That means in the original you can really read the the writing here. And um, my plan is to build a working functional replica of this. That means I leave the electronic uh, boards, like the complete, everything that is outside of the console, uh, I leave it away. I also, uh, at the current state, do not try to emulate the we had a, just a discussion about that. That's why I say that I do not try to emulate the electronics of the machine with modern components. So I will run the, the software for the moment because uh, uh, there are enough problems uh, for the moment, uh, for me at least, um, on a normal PC. What will be reconstructed is the console using the original components, meaning the lamps, the uh, switches, and also the CRTs, which will be uh, different from the machine, from the original machine, will be hanging freely in the, in the space, so people, people, I mean most people won't be, uh, won't know what a, what a CRT is, I mean they know what a television is, but they, they won't know like the technical details be behind uh, CRTs, so I want to hang the CRTs freely here. And the installation is in two parts. Um, so the love letter generated will be projected on a public space uh, somewhere else. And uh, the uh, image from this installation will be fed back in to the installation. And if you manage to type your name on the machine's typewriter in Bordeaux code, <laughs> then your signature will appear here. So you can actually publicly address love letters to your beloved one via the, the installation. So that's the more of the museum, uh, so the thrill for, for people to actually use it and not just to look at it. And uh, these are some, some uh, plans, they're all obsolete because they, um, they do not, they, these are metrical, these are the old metrical plans, they have no, they are totally useless now. I have uh, converted now to inches, so, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I had to because obviously the, when I designed the, con oops, when I designed the console, I, and uh, I uh, tried to estimate the outer dimensions, the only thing I could do to somehow get valid results was to make sure that these were full inches and not full centimeters. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, yeah, then if you leave the metric system, you know why the metric system is so wonderful because then you need all those nice English standards and you need 8 BA screws and so on and so forth. <laughs> and um, for all, uh, all, again, for this project, uh, I was dependent on a huge number of people, especially on Christopher Burton again for uh, what is called, I think, a junk pile, or <laughs> pulling out things out of these junk piles that are were extremely, like for example, the push buttons. I, I, I By now, I think I have quite okay contacts with uh, people who deal with uh, antique technology. So I was able to find the CRTs even after Chris had bought out the complete market. That was fine. <laughs> Um, I was also able to find the switches in a very nice form. I think they were from a Spitfire cockpit, so they could be modified from a uh, two-state, non-stable 
to three state stable. So I had so so to say joker switches because. And this is very convenient if you have different switches and you're having problems with one th sort of switches, so that was fine. But for example, uh, I have never come across these push buttons you see here, and I doubt that it's... Uh, I, I, I simply got them from Chris and I'm very happy about them. They work perfectly with some uh, VD40. And um, the, the lamps have been a big problem. That, uh, and finally, uh, I received uh, some lamp caps from uh, Bletchley Park, from Tony, for which I'm also very grateful. And the most, uh, 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 or not the most, but another thing I'm extremely grateful for, um, I pointed, that's why I pointed out the Creed TD printer before. Here it is, um, after uh, an exchange that was very close to, how do you call it, mythical? No, you call it, um, I don't know, it was one of the craziest uh, trips I ever made. So I met up with, uh, I wanted to meet up with Kevin in Brussels, which wasn't a good idea because Brussels is very crowded and it's difficult to meet. And in the end, Kevin proposed to meet in Turin. And so we met in Turin on a parking place and exchanged two machines. And apparently the foreign secret services weren't following us, but we, I felt really strange. So this is now sitting at my, at my home. The mechanical, there were some slight mechanical damages to it. So for example, the governor here was slightly bent. There was a part on the other side bent. The mechanical fixing has been done. And uh, I do not expect problems with the electricity nor the signals. Uh, uh, we will uh, carry the two dinosaurs now to Hamburg, uh, where we have the right, uh, the right uh, amplifiers and everything to try to do that. And I, I don't expect any problems in, in starting them. If we have, uh, we'll try to, we'll try to solve them. So that was a wonderful thing. Thank you. Um, yeah. I should mention that this uh, exhibition will open on the 2nd of April in uh, ZK in Karlsruhe. So, in two or three weeks. <coughs> And uh, ZK in Karlsruhe is one of the biggest media art museum in, I think in, it's the biggest in the world, sim simply. It feels funny to say that, but it's, it's true. This used to be a, uh, it's also a very uh, interesting story of this building. Uh, a, certain, uh, a certain psychologist from uh, Germany has proposed to um, uh, how do you call this? If you drive Satan out of a building, you um, exercise. exercise exactly to exercise the building because it was an ammunition factory of the of the Nazis. Yeah. And this very nice building style is simply uh, comes from the fact that uh, if you drop a bomb in here, um, nothing is damaged. You have the so-called light uh, um, holes, big holes, and you drop in a bomb. You fix the roof and you production continues and this is how this it's a monster building what you see here is probably uh, one third of the real thing and it's full of computer art so even though Karlsruhe is not a very interesting town I highly recommend the ZKM and especially the 2nd of April too everybody here would be more than glad to welcome everybody <laughs> um, okay so that's uh, this part of the oh yeah, I should probably show the state of affairs right now. This picture was taken some days ago, so that's the. It looks a bit artificial because I tried to remove the background a bit, but it's the real machine. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a virtual creation, but the real thing. So as you can see here, I. Um, Translated. Uh, okay. I wanted to show.
show this before. So if you have two high resolution photos, the big problem you have is perspective. Perspective is wonderful, but if you want to abstract the exact measuring information out of a uh, photo with uh, perspective, uh, it gets, uh, at least for me, it got uh, I was really astonishing, as astonished how difficult it is to get the real measures out of a perspective photo. And uh, the best technique I have found, or not I, but uh, a typographer called Uwe Koch, who also did the, the writing on the machine in a very uh, clean way. Uh, the best way is actually to stretch the, the photo in a way that the perspective is taken out of the picture with a normal uh, photo like fo uh, program like, like Photoshop. And you see here the result. So now the switch, the form of the switches is completely dis uh, uh, disturbed or wrong, but the positioning of the screws and of the buttons is absolutely correct. And it's even more correct. So that's an overlay of him to prove to me that my sizes are slightly wrong, mm -hmm. which were done in a more primitive, with a more primitive uh, technique by taking the uh, known distance between the screws as a reference point. At that point, I had a switch at home, so I could measure it, and then calculating the rest out by. Uh, in case of the uh, horizontal plane, you can simply measure. And in case of the vertical plane, uh, it's a kind of a mixture between measuring and guesswork and speculation and so on. And you see that uh, there, I, I, I learned that there was a perfect way to do it and I was very happy. So that was the way to actually produce the CAD uh, drawings you can say, see here now. And these were then given to a, uh, to a metal uh, workshop that uh, turns this uh, main, you, you give them the cat drawings and uh, they turn them into metal apart from the fact that because they don't use laser technology I had to drill all the holes uh, that are below three millimeters myself. Um, oh yeah, that's another component you need. Um, this is the component I had uh, uh, also a lot of trouble in, in getting and I don't, I'm still missing, this is a, a, a how do you call that, a call for help. I'm still missing 33 of these uh, lamps They were used in telephone exchanges uh, uh, from the 50s I guess to the 70s and I have been unable to find any more of the lamp bodies. I have enough of the caps but I'm still missing the bodies and I'm now working with a uh, lamp from the 1960s, uh, also British uh, type, but unfortunately uh, the distance between the screws in this case is different and it is not, um, are these 8BA screws? I think it's 8BA screws and uh, the other one has 6BA screws, so I can't fit them into my console because it was, would uh, look funny to suddenly have uh, lamps with a different uh, screw size. So now I need to construct something to, uh, to adjust the, the lamps if nothing turns up. Oh, is that? Yeah, these are two more decorative images of the machine. Um, I also didn't have the right number of uh, caps for the switches. I found uh, somebody who uh, airbrushed them for me, which is a very, very good technology. Because other, if, you, if you put them into uh, paint, it will close the, it will change the structure of the, uh, of the switch. Like this, you almost don't see it. It's very difficult to spot now. And he will also paint the lamps. I have a lot of lamp, white lamp caps now, but uh, I need also green and blue ones, and he will also try that. And as you can see in the next picture, another question was how to do the, uh, the captions on the, on the machine. 
And also here it turns up, turned out, and it's quite a typical thing that uh, the way it was done in the original way was the most uh, intelligent way to do it. So after uh, considering a huge number of alternative uh, possibilities and finding out for each that it was not possible to do it that way, for example, cutting out a negative, oops, uh, cutting out a negative laser image of the um, of the writing is not possible because the laser below a certain font size will make the edges round of the fonts, so that's not possible. So otherwise, you would have uh, could have sprayed black on. The, so what we did is now uh, it was engraved like in the original and then filled with black paint. So it's very much like the original. I very much hope. Um, this is the mysterious chess clock that I'm trying to find. It says Drac on it, and I was informed by, an, by, by a UK chess clock expert who is not here, I think, or is he? Frank Camarata, no. Um, that this wasn't a Drac chess clock, but this was in fact a Solora chess clock forged as a Drac chess timer. <laughs> I have no further information on this, but I would be interested to find a chess clock that is similar. I, have been, I haven't found anything yet. So Laura clocks are extremely, um, extremely rare. It's a Swiss company that closed down uh, very quickly, it didn't exist very long, and um, I, uh, this expert had three and just uh, sold two of them off and one has a high value for him, so he won't even lend it to me, unfortunately. Shall I now start the how complete shall I survey the software? Because I have already spent considerable time on the hardware aspect. Shall I go ahead? Yeah. yeah just say just say stop. Or something in this direction. So um, this is now the the research on the on the Ferranti Mark I uh, software between 1948 and 1958 approximately. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one could estimate that uh, approximately 200 programs might have been written uh, in that period. Of these programs, I'm, I'm searching for programs intensively and on many ways, um, sometimes bridge clubs are more helpful than uh, libraries, for example. Uh, I'm searching uh, in many ways for, for this software. And uh, this is what I have uh, found, or I definitely know of these programs. The, um, uh, I'm, I'm starting now with the simple to the more complex, also scientifically complex. So you see here there are five main areas of programming. One is engineering, so the calculation of the stability of engineering structures and so on. Uh, here two names and uh, all the names I name, or all the persons I name uh, today stand for a lot of other persons who have done similar things but uh, uh, I didn't uh, notice them yet or however. I, my impression is that one pioneer in computational engineering is Robert Ken Livesley. I have one program of his, thanks to Martin Campbell Kelly who gave me a lot of material he had obtained for his original research. I also have some letters. And uh, he's, as far as I know, he's still alive. Um, then there is Christopher Strachey. So that's the Strachey Archive, Bodleian Library, Oxford. That's easy to get. It's all there, uh, obviously, because Christopher Strachey knew well before his death that he was dying. He, so if you look at his archive, it, uh, it feels like a museum. He really um, prepared everything. Everything is ordered and commented. and. He gives uh, explanations of ideas and so on. Um, and then uh, 
there is uh, meteor meteorology, and um, that here the pioneer uh, seems to be Fred Bushby from the Metrological Office. Um, I have all the research papers of Fred Bushby, but all my attempts to uh, contact the Metrological Office that has moved by now to um, contact uh, what is known as the old Met Office boys through a bridge club somewhere um, have not um, have, uh, led to the result that I uh, would be in contact with uh, Fred Bushby's uh, family. I learned that uh, his uh, second wife di uh, died last Christmas. Uh, he seems to have a son. I have no further information. And my impression is that I won't get further information from the Metrological Office. So if any of you knows anything about anybody involved in this research, please let me know. Um, the situation is quite different for X-ray crystallography. Um, here the main names are Derwood Crickshank, Gordon Cox, uh, both Leeds, so the center of crystallographic activity seems to have been Leeds, and uh, just to, uh, to have her in, no, not, not just to have her in, but because also she's connected to Derwood Crickshank, who did uh, who did calculations for her? That's uh, documented. Um, Dorothy Hodgkin, who won the Nobel Prize, as you know. And um, the Darwood Crickshank. I'm in contact with uh, with a colleague of Darwood Crickshank, who is currently uh, cataloging <laughs> the papers of uh, Crickshank, and who is hopeful that. Uh, it's actually in crystallography. It's quite um, um, quite uh, a simple case because apparently uh, a certain program was written in 1953 by David Crickshank, and then it was handed over to a lot of other crystallographers who reused this program in a slightly modified form. Uh, I know from a from an article of uh, David Crickshank that this program is approximately 28 or 30 pages long. And yeah, I very much hope it will be found in the Crickshank archive because then that part would be settled. Um, uh, then there is the, now comes the uh, rather hard, uh, also for me, rather hard <coughs> cookies. I won't give a survey of quantum chemistry at this point. Uh, something that uh, was very, a very lucky coincidence for me was to find Hoof on Pritchett, who is still alive in Canada, who collaborated with uh, Frank Sumner, who all of you, I guess, know, and uh, who uh, sent me over the course of the last few months three major programs by, written by him, Frank Sumner, a certain Brian F. Gray, who recently retired in Australia, and uh, Ron Mason. And these are three programs that are quite complete. I will show the material I have in a minute. Then the third uh, unknown variable, let's call it, is uh, the atomic research establishment, research in nuclear physics. Uh, the two names here seem to be Alec or Alec Glenny and Nick Hoskin. It is extremely difficult to get in contact with the at at atomic research establishment, and I haven't located a chess or bridge club to ask <laughs> in that case. So I would be again very help, uh, very grateful for any hints that uh, could lead. To uh, especially to the software of Alec Glenny, it's uh, absolutely obvious that Alec Glenny was a, a most important pioneer of programming. Uh, this is, uh, for example, advocated by the fact that already in the 1960s, a certain Donald Knut was trying to get in contact with Alec Glenny to find out about his autocode programs. So. Um, uh, would, I, th I think it would be of extreme importance to, to find the, the software and I'm doing everything I can to, to find it. 
And now comes a page with Miss Shalanin's, but nonetheless interesting programs, which don't fit the major scientific uh, disciplines that were using computers. Um, that's uh, a very uh, curious example is the emulation of the Ferranti Pegasus on the Ferranti uh, Mark I. I found this program also complete with uh, explanations and everything in the Charles Babbage Institute in Minnesota. It was written by Donald G. Aronson, who was a colleague of Christopher Strait, she and uh, uh, Gillis, I think. Um, then there is uh, morphogenesis, well-known calculations by Alan Turing, uh, partially uh, uh, conserved at various places, but very probably not in a state to be resurrected. At least I can't see any uh, way to do this. What I have seen are single printouts of things. We do not know where they come from. We do not know how much of this material um, uh, still exists. We do not know how much has been taken away. Um, so this is quite, quite fragmentary. Um, then there is the chess program. So that's one uh, uh, segment, let's call it games and artificial <coughs> intelligence in quotation marks. Uh, that's the drafts program by Christopher Strachey that's preserved. It's uh, probably the first uh, more complex software ever. That's the one that was playing God Save the Queen in, in the end. Uh, that's, uh, that uh, I have at home. I just need to uh, try to run it. Then the chess program seems to have been thrown away by the wife of Dietrich Gilprinz from all that uh, I could learn when he was away. She emptied a certain garage and uh, the, that the program probably was in there as far or, or I have not been able to find any other information or any of the material by Prince, which is also quite odd because uh, he was one of the, in the time, he was one of the more active uh, characters. He wrote the third version of the manual. He did a lot of, he wrote several programs I, I know of but I've been completely unable to turn to find anything of, of his, also not by direct contact with his family. Um, the love letters we know already. Then there is uh, a section mathematics and logics. Um, here uh, the first items you find are test routines from the, from the baby, uh, the highest common factor routine by Tuto and Tom Kilborn. Successive uh, division by Tutil, probably, or at least found in his notebook. Long division routine, uh, that's quite interesting, because that then leads over to the more scientific things, because that's exactly that uh, you could implement long the so-called long divisions on the computer was the reason why you were saving so much time, for example, in uh, molecular chemistry, because these were the really time-consuming calculations. You uh, would do otherwise by hand. Uh, Mersenne primes, and there is a thesis by Audrey Bates on symbolic logic, and naturally what I uh, left out now were, were a lot of um, uh, less algorith from the algorithmic complexity, less uh, interesting programs like wages calculations, insurance calculations, uh, traffic uh, uh, calculations and things like that, that were mer mainly done within Ferranti. You could also uh, make a list of that, and I'm also very interested to locate concrete programming examples in that area, um, but I haven't found uh, uh, anything anywhere in the, in the archives, unfortunately, and also uh, strangely. And then there are a number uh, on the last part of the page, a number of operating systems and compilers. There is uh, the schemes I already talked about and uh, the first attempts to uh, make programming less tiresome by writing early compilers by uh, Alec Glennie, most important, and Tony Brooker. And uh, I'm uh, not sure if uh, in the material of Martin Campbell Kelly 
uh, there is enough information on autocode to resurrect it. I, I'm, I'm not sure about it. I haven't checked that, but it could be. I'm showing, if I may go on, now it's about images, so it's less painful. That's the long division routine by Turing, long factor routine, uh, highest factor routine, so the, the first, I should pause a second, because this is the first calculation, I think. Uh, if, um, is, it the, is it the first calculation that was ever executed? Is it this one? Yes. No, right. right. It's, it's a different version of, but the same. This came from Alan Turing. Yes. The Senate handout, and we posted it up to the University of July. was the highest common factor? Uh, the first was highest common factor. Yes, but another, not this program, but it, I, I know the discussion, a different different program that is not found in the tutor notebook. This one is in the tutor notebook. So it's the earlier version of this one that was executed. Okay. Uh, sorry, what does that say? Okay. No, that's uh, Kilburn sorry, highest I'm factor routine uh, amended. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Uh, that's that is uh, the amended version of the thing that ran on the 21st. Okay. This, was, this uh, didn't destroy itself when it ran. The one that ran on the ah. 21st destroyed itself. Oh, that's very... <laughs> that's a nice feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is now from the engineering uh, papers of uh, Robert Kandinsky. This is a um, main uh, a frame construction for a power station for I would have to look that up. It's a, it, it was uh, tested in practice, so it's a uh, it's a factory that was really built, and uh, it was uh, the the computerized method was tested, and this is the the example it was tested on. And these are exactly that's the first part of the paper. So you see it's a program for analyzing torsional vibrations and balanced in balanced structures. And that's quite quite usual in the in if if uh, you are lucky this is what you get. So you get an illustration of the program, then you usually get a flow diagram of the program, and in the end you get the, the code, the actual code. And possible result printouts. So that's that's now the flowchart for the program. This is the first or one of the pages of this program from 1954. This should have been the oh I think I should come to an end. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't know. This is a software I wrote myself. Yeah. Um, also about the Ferrot uh, installation. So um, Ferranti sold two machines, one to Manchester and one to Toronto. About the, this is the only photo I have of the uh, Ferrot installation, and there seems to be a difference in the little panel you see here, which is regular for the Manchester Ferranti Mark I. And yeah, I think there, there were only two Mark I's, but then there were quite a few Mark I stars, yes. which are quite different. Yes. That's a Ferranti Mark I. Oh. Trixie Wells name. Yes. I listen. Okay. Yeah, but that's the only photo I, I could find of the. It's, it's a wonderful photo. 
Um, but you can see here that the, the this panel that was replaced at a certain point. Um, this is the reason why this machine has this this panel. So you can uh, put uh, a different one on there. And I'm actually building now the Toronto version of the machine because I'm rebuilding this panel. Um, this is now the other engineering project that's uh, Christopher Strachey um, designing the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway. I think it was about calculations uh, about the flow of water. So here you see his formalization of the problem. I think these are different parts of the, of the Seaway. This is the flow diagram of the program. And that's the first page. That's also complete. This is the, I just show a second coding page to show the Fairwood program sheet as opposed to the Manchester programming sheet that you see here. This is uh, now Fred Bushby, the meteorological calculations. The uh, location of source code is unknown, but you can see here the comparison of the, so he did weather prediction, and you see here the differences between, so A is always the, com the actual, so reality chart, and on the right side, uh, side you see a, um, a prediction, I think, uh, 24 hours ahead, and you see that uh, in this case, for example, the match is rather close. And for example, in this case, uh, like just if you just look for from the shapes, the match is rather not so very close. And here is a third one. All of this research that also uh, uh, we are talking about a research that uh, went on for. Uh, tens and twenties of years and uh, developed into different models and so on. This is uh, quite, a, quite a thick package uh, that needs to be found. And now I come to the field of X-ray crystallography. Um, this is actually quite easier than it sounds. This is the German uh, inventor, so to say, of X-ray crystallography, Max von Laue. And this is the first ever X-ray photography. So um, the idea in X-ray crystallography is uh, actually quite simple. Uh, X-rays happen to have uh, the same, approximately the same uh, wavelength, than or the same uh, are of the same order, the wavelengths, than the distances between the atoms in molecules. So if you um, uh, shoot uh, Röntgen beams on uh, X-rays on a uh, crystal. What you get is like what you get if you put a candle, like it's just a difference in dimensions. If you put a candle or a lamp behind a normal-sized or human-sized object, you get a shadow at the at the at some some kind of wall, which doesn't give you the absolute uh, dimensions, but it gives you the relative spacing of the elements. And uh, so here you can see, like the, I think this is some kind of copper. Uh, I won't, uh, I'm not sure. It's some kind of uh, some sort of copper crossed crystal. I can can look it up. And here are three more of the very early X-ray uh, crystallographies. And uh, X-ray crystallography is actually permitted uh, to correct the, uh, f um, the ideas or concepts one had of uh, crystals in an empirical way by positioning the uh, different uh, parts of the molecules more precisely by quite uh, astonishing mathematical means, which I won't go into. I mean, the, the basic idea is very easy. If you then look, what are they trying to calculate, uh, it gets quite uh, interesting. I'm just showing some pictures to give you an impression how the, this is like the classical description of a molecule or of a, of a crystal. 
and then you can see it evolves into a mapping. And this is obviously of when it was applied to more organic structures by uh, Dorothy Hodgkin and others, which led directly to uh, nowadays uh, genetics. And that's one and the same science and very much the, the same methodology until, until today. So this is a strange substance by the name of ethylenethylurea. And uh, it was um, uh, done by this one program that Crickshank wrote, and he gave it to, uh, or uh, did these calculations for Wheatley, or gave the program to him. So the, uh, I'm showing the Wheatley, uh, or the parts of the Wheatley paper, because the Crickshank paper doesn't contain interesting uh, images. So you see here now uh, the calculation of the, the bond lengths and the the uh, uh, distances and uh, angles between the uh, molecules. I just leave this uncommented. And this is, uh, uh, in this context, probably the most interesting part. This is uh, in the direct um, thanks to the university, uh, digital computer at the University of Manchester. Exactly, and here we can see also that Crickshank provided the program. So this is the last paragraph of the of the article. And uh, this is another paper by Wheatley on the structure of something I won't try to uh, uh, speak. And uh, I'm showing you this for the wonderful pictures. And he obviously, um, they used uh, uh, on one side the Leo computer and on the other side the Manchester Computing Lab computer. <laughs> uh, this is Hoof on Pritchard in 61. And uh, this is, uh, now I won't comment, I'll just show the rest of the pictures if you would like to see them because uh, I don't think it makes much sense to give an introduction to molecular chemistry in five minutes. <laughs> it's weird stuff, I can say. So that's the program to actually produce this orbit orbital map of hydrogen, which happens to be the only uh, the molecule that is uh, simple enough to calculate it out completely. It's the only uh, molecule that can be calculated out completely in quantum theory. And here are some attempts to, to show that it's uh, easier to, or more exact, to uh, approximate certain wave functions by a set of 10 uh, wave functions than by a single one. And this is the program that does this. And this is, this is the output of the program. Um, this is from an article on uh, the Kant's, ca, ca, uh, the question was, does, does do certain uh, aromatic uh, um, uh, substances uh, cause cancer? And that's the research. Move on, Pritchard did the calculations, and also this program has survived. It's just here to remind us that this material is still missing. Penalty Pegasus. That's the first part of the simulator, or the description of the simulator. The first part on the page of the code. It's about 20 pages. The uh, very beautiful morphogenesis uh, calculations by Turing. Um, these are all, this is all uh, Bordeaux code, no? and then the, it's painted out to see what this, the code actually means. Another one of these. Uh, one part, that's I, I guess an important routine by the name of Ibsen. The drafts program. That's a, a series of wonderful photographs of the original program running. <laughs> 
created by Strachey in '51. Flow diagram, code. Dietrich Gibbons uh, running his program on the Ferranti Mark I machine. And we are back to the beginning. And um, the only th thing I wanted to add is, uh, and then I'm finished, is that um, this possibility of uh, science to advance through the use of computers also means that um, uh, also could be a trap in case that uh, the corresponding programs that led to novel discoveries are not resurrected. Because in that case, we would be in a situation where a certain segment of, uh, in the development of scientific knowledge could not be reconstructed. And this is uh, uh, absolutely it's the same situation than that something has never existed. And that would be a very sad situation. Thank you. The hardware random number generator. Oh, and that's uh, uh, that's in an interesting question because um, it uh, allows me to say that I can't believe. I mean, uh, I've presented all the fields that uh, have used the machine. One I have omitted, and it's almost impossible that they didn't use the machine. That's. Uh, I can't believe that uh, the cryptologists and cryptographers in the UK did absolutely didn't use the machine. Do you know what the uh, <coughs> hardware random number generator is? Sorry? How did the uh, hardware random number generator work? Uh, I think Simon can explain that perfectly. I can also blow the diode. Yes. A real random generator. <laughs> no, that's why you could use it. Right. Yeah, that's why they exactly. Yeah. Yes, it was. It was. On the recommendation of Turing after he returned from USA. Because it was useful for Monte Carlo simulations, I suppose. Uh, well, it's all very well. It means you can't duplicate. If you have a pseudo random number, then you can rerun the program to see if it can work. That's why von Neumann recommended the use of pseudo number. Yeah. Yes. 
the seminars uh, at Cambridge, um, he came gave one from programming in a uh, uh, higher level language, a language designed for the user rather than any way to write the, to represent the, the computer to start at higher level. And I think that was the first people of a programmer, programming language designed for the user rather than the computer. Mm -hmm. That's uh, autocode. Uh, Mm -hmm. David Wheeler was quite good at that. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Well, it wasn't high level time. language either. You've got a lot of time. I know. Uh, cool. Yeah, uh, coming back to the thing from the snow letter, um, it is, is the singular writer for the plural. I, I can distinctly remember as a first year um, research student working in the University Laboratory in Manchester, distinctly remember seeing this piece of paper on the notice board, a piece of paper. And my question is, uh, we, we, we was, I think there was no authorship on it. I think it was, that uh, comes from this fellow, straight to you, we never saw it. <laughs> from this fellow, um, Turing, who was director of the computation of all the who we also never saw, unless we used the machine between 10 p.m. and midnight, <laughs> because Turing, always used it from midnight to 8 a.m. So uh, that's, that's how it is. So my, my, my question is really, um, was, are we talking here about one letter, or are we talking about lots of letters? I can only recall, I mean, it wasn't a, as if there was a whole bunch <coughs> of these letters, you know, we knew what this is because it letter. Mm -hmm. I can only remember seeing one that caused some amusement. But, you know, we're serious minded people. Um, there, uh, like this is what survives in uh, Manchester Museum of Science and Industry, and uh, Philip Blythe was so kind to f uh, find a number of printouts of. <coughs> that's one. That's the only one in uh, Manchester. And then here in London, at Science Museum. How many printouts there are? How many letters? How many letters? Are there many letters? Generally? I mean, uh, uh, principally. In principle, could the program generate? The instances, the types. Oh, the, um, I think I, I calculated it once. I might be missing, but it's uh, definitely over eight million different uh, letters. But they were all from one algorithm, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. I think what you're saying. There's, there's one algorithm. I don't, I, don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't I don't know. I don't know. Spectre Strange didn't then didn't make another album. Yeah, that's the question. No, no, but that but the mean how many were well, pr ever printed out? That, that is an instance of a letter. Ah, exactly. How many how many uh, not how many instances of a letter are there of that letter? Because you know that we don't have different ones. Yeah, then, then I, uh, I understood you correctly in the first uh, instance. Mm -hmm. This is one, and then there's another um, uh, sheet with five printouts, with uh, uh, apparently a faultless run, preserved in the uh, 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 London Science Museum's yeah, archive. Yeah. Okay. And then there are the examples that uh, Strachey gives in an article in Encounter. That's the most well-known one. Yeah. Approximately how long did it take to, to generate each letter? Uh, in the machine, <laughs> on the machine at the time. Yeah. Uh, that depends on the, I think the, the bottleneck in this case would be the printer, as always. And uh, it printed, I think, six characters per second. <laughs> okay. That algorithm was right. But the algorithm, how, how long did it take to get through the algorithm of its own? Um, I, d I don't think that would be the limiting factor in that case. No, 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 no. Um, I think uh, several minutes. Several minutes? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah, it's a very primitive, it's just handing over addresses to the printer. Like from a computational viewpoint. Here. I think the, the simulation uh, may be uh, running probably 10 uh, faster by a factor of 1 to 10 or so for comparison. Mm -hmm.
a slightly different question about the um, rebuild that you've done at ZKM and the... Um, we'll do, we'll do. Or will do, very soon. <laughs> um, and about the user experience of that, I'm not, I'm not quite clear what people are unable to do. Can you actually enter data into the machine using all... How much can the people interact with it? And how much is it just an installation that goes there? And also, how much are you interpreting what the actual history of the machine? Is it just a, something that's going to be there, or are you going to actually look at, you know, during the strategy? Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, the machine will be complemented by a, uh, another software of mine, which is uh, it's a quite simple 3D program. You give it uh, scans of uh, material and it displays it in a way that seems to be quite appealing to museum visitors. At least it's, uh, we are running it since uh, five years in ZKM. And it's animating the page, t the turning of pages. I, I, when they asked me uh, to, to write this program, I first rejected it because I thought it too too stupid to use the computer to um, to simulate uh, the page turning that, uh, of paper. Uh, I'm quite happy that I programmed it after making a lot of other su suggestions. And uh, on there, I would like to present uh, background material of various uh, thoughts. I've already asked the National Museum for the History of Computing for the uh, for Tutel's lab notebook because I think that would be uh, an enormous uh, addition to be able to understand what what this is, especially in, in uh, Germany, where there's no awareness whatsoever of the fact that the first computer was invented in the UK because as we all know the first computer was invented in the USA and um, um, the, um, I want to get the logbooks of the engineers if possible at any reasonable pricing uh, I have asked the uh, Manchester uh, archive for a possibility to do some kind of inter-museum loan to get out of the, this uh, story because I'm uh, <coughs> slightly fed up with the situation to, um, like for example with the Love Letters work, I'm clearly conserving material that is held in the archive. Um, if I want to do this work, I first have to pay uh, uh, substantial sums to the archive to help them. And this is a situation that is slightly slightly absorbed for me and um, the user in the installation will be able to um, as I said if uh, he or she manages to type her name on the push buttons at the uh, last row it, uh, so if the input is plausible in some way and constitutes a name it will appear as a signature under the love letter so uh, that's, that's one thing um, then once per day at a random moment the Creed 7 Taylor printer will print one love letter only um, we will see how the public reacts to that I mean uh, if it happens once in 24 hours you can't really wait for it but I don't know let's see the same uh, will happen uh, once per day, uh, uh, God Save the Queen, or probably another of the horrible tunes that are, uh, have, been, have come down to us, like Blah Blah Blah, Black Sheep and so, uh, might be played once per day, very loud, because I learned <laughs> that the, the hooter of the machine must have been uh, incredibly loud and absolutely non, not appropriate to a user computer user situation. Um, Can I tell a story about computer music? We were installing the machine from the university. Someone in the next day had written the Italian national anthem for us to play the chorus with the computer. We started off the mirror road to say, and the people do it so on. And the man behind me whispered, that's the fastest anthem. <laughs> That's the what? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what, what, what are you displaying, or are you looking at the Williams, or 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 the Williams,
Oh yes. <laughs> oh yeah, we had uh, uh, we had slight uh, problems in getting the components because it's uh, nowadays you only use these components if you want to uh, build radio senders or so. That's quite out of fashion. Um, I will have a uh, radiologist on site to make sure that uh, the one cam emission is not too high for, for the public. <laughs> because all the theoretical considerations, uh, I've asked several people, like, if you power these uh, things that are uh, guaranteed not to be shielded in any way, right? um, if you power these things with 4,500 volts, how much Röntgen emission do you, do you get? The answer to that seems to be quite complicated. I couldn't get a straightaway answer from anybody. So um, we are measuring it. And uh, yeah, we are closing, like, there will be no open contact at the uh, tubes. And yeah, I mean, the, the, the tubes are running already. So the main control and, uh, is working, and we are adjusting now. But I'm quite confident. You mentioned that the, the radar screen was originally used for a certain purpose, and, and there may be some radar experts here, I appreciate you are. But you talked about suppressing the, subtracting the one image from the other, preserving the image. But I thought that the way the station was on to you was by sending two blips very close to one another and seeing if they came back the same distance apart within the scan, not between the scans. So, did anybody here who could put me right on that? I can. I have, I have found the system I described in, yeah, the, in the archive. And that's also where Bill Elliott comes, comes into this uh, development. Because it was him who, who, did, the, who did try to, to uh, implement MTI based on ELA lines in the UK. Well, then. Yes. I think I'm dead. So, Okay. <laughs> Reasons of your yeah. I see, I don't know. I as a matter of terminology, I think that might be saying that um, it was permanent echo cancellation that was the main thing. Clutter is a technical term that happens at the moment, C clutter, rain clutter, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have uh, various electronic ways to minimize it that on the radar set at C, you still get clutter. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's probably time to wrap up. Um, David, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, you've given me an interesting afternoon because in you put up there lots of names of people and I realise I know over half of them. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately I knew nothing of that work because it was a different era and I was a small boy at the time. So I, that was a comfort to me in the end. <laughs> it was fascinating to see those names and I'll talk to you later about extra crystallography. Thank you very much, David. It's very stimulating and extremely interesting work. Thank you.